I like that background there, Nick. In Tokyo or something? <laughs> um, it's actually Osaka, I think. China. Oh, nice. Okay. Just a question, and I, I asked this because of my job. Well, my my picture won't be up there, will it? Uh, I can remove it. Okay, that would be cool if you don't mind, only because. So I'm in a job where um, I'm I'm actually a teacher, and it's it's very hard to speak out on these kind of things without. Um, it can be a risk to <laughs> your job. Which, is, which which really sucks, but you know it's kind of a something that goes par for the course. I'm in the same boat. I'm an instructor at a programming school, a coding boot camp, but I've just kind of accepted the risk at this point. But I totally hear where you're coming from. It is a risk that you have to take, and so not everyone's really willing to accept that. It is, yeah. It's it's one of those things that um, you know. I I think when I get to the point where I am, you know, financially set enough and, and, you know, probably right. nearing retirement and, and tenure where I can kind of speak my mind. I'm sure it'll be different, but it's, at the moment it, it's, it's still, you know, it's crazy that we're actually in this situation or just the environment is like this, where you really have to be conscientious of, of how you approach this subject and how public you're willing to be and things like that. And you can't really just come out and say, what's on your mind uh, you really do have to censor your voice and i really am the longer i go um the more i think about it, the more i'm like really bothered by that that we're unable to publicly share how we feel because of the repercussions that would come from our job and other types of things it's just it's really a type of censorship that i'm not comfortable with and i i find that so interesting in and, you know, in this this time and age when we're usually so open about everything else, I mean, I can speak from my own background um, being LGBT. Mm-hmm. It was easier to come out of the closet than it was to come out about That's autonomy for this. Nice say that. Yeah, There's I mean, it's, it's. Oh, sorry, sorry. go ahead. Oh, I was going to say there. it's interesting because I think there are some similarities. It's not obviously the exact same experience, but like when I was coming out to my parents and my family about being upset about being circumcised, I did think, you know, maybe there are some parallels here with this experience because it really was kind of, I was revealing, it's like an identity almost being upset about exactly. Um, It's, yeah, it's, it, it really takes on something larger than I was expecting, but um, yeah, I think there are some similarities there, but I would caution how I would bring that up to maybe members of the LGBTQ community because they might be potentially upset about comparing those experiences. I don't know. I found some, you certainly aren't, but I found some, you know, when I try to compare this to female genital cutting or things like that, I've seen some very hostile responses. So I, I wonder if there's some caution that I should have there. I, I run into that same ideal with talking about, you know, FGM, which is, is a terrible thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and at, at what drives me crazy is when, um, people refuse to refer to male circumcision as MGM. They they say, so you know. Sometimes in conversation, when I bring it up, I'll I'll spin it around and say female circumcision, and they'll say, well, why are you saying that? I'm saying, well, if we're labeling it as M- as we're not, if we're not going to label it as MGM for men, why are we la- labeling it as M- as FGM for females? Right. right. It's, it's it's it continues to kind of be this divide between the genders, which you know, in a time where, where we are for full gender equality yeah. and we, and full inclusion and all these, these things that, you know, in, in 2020 should be a given, we're still creating that rift, which I think causes a lot of pain and, and issues for people. Yeah, this is a touchy subject to dance around, but I do feel a degree of genuine sexism on this issue. And I, I feel like I understand what that like what that reality is like when one gender is afforded certain privileges and protections and the other is, you know, it's completely absent. And any, any avenue that I've tried to take to elevate my concerns to elected officials has been brushed off as something very trivial or they can't handle this matter or really almost as if it was something not even worth their time. 
And then I see how they approach FGM and it's this, this issue of profound significance. And I don't even get the opportunity to break down my thoughts on this topic because I believe that if I were to be able to get in a room of elected officials and really just get to the crux of the issue here, break down the anatomical loss, show the trauma that is happening to a neonate, there's no way that they're able to just push this to the side anymore. So the biggest tragedy here, I believe, is that I, the people who really have, you know, can deliver this message aren't even able to get in an audience to do it. You know, I'm not like, that's not, I'm not asking you to even change your mind. I'm just saying, can I present the argument in like a formal setting to elected officials? That's all I'm looking to do. And I can't even get that opportunity where I see other people, their voices are getting elevated to the highest level, just with the snap of their fingers. And I, I'm like, why am I struggling so bad? I've tried engaging with city officials. I've tried engaging with my local city council, county council. Um, and there is just really no interest in engaging or exploring this issue. And obviously the, the reasons that they have are for self-preservation, right? Engaging right. in this issue exactly. is, and I'm, and I was there, a lot of us are in the same boat. Um, there's a line and if you cross it, you're in a totally different territory now. And uh, yeah, somebody eventually has to take that, that leap though and start at calling this what it is. And some people do, but I don't know if they are doing it in the right uh, medium right now. Like Brother K, for example, I'm not trying to talk about Brother K behind his back, but he's targeting one arena right now and probably doing it effectively, you know, for a certain audience. But there's a whole other segment that, you know, we have to um, introduce ourselves into and really start being a part of that narrative and being a part of that discord. And I found personally for me, trying to engage in that arena is nearly impossible right now. Um, you really need, I, I don't know what next step to take, but I know that it needs to be taken. Some next step needs to be taken where you can engage with elected officials and seriously just be like, if you doubt anything that I'm saying right now, then I have you know significant amounts of video evidence where I will go frame by frame and show you where the trauma is occurring where a child is being genitally tortured, strapped down, and you know, really heinously violated in an mm -hmm. excruciating um, and wildly perverse surgical penile modification. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll close on that. But yeah, that's that's those are some great points, guys. You know, it's interesting the intactivist movement right now. Um, it it seems in some ways rather disorganized because I feel like there are so many different factions of it that are kind of all trying to do the same thing, but, you know, the way they're going about doing it, um, you've got, you know, one group that's, you know, trying to put out these very vindictive, you know, how dare you allow this to happen types of things. You've got other groups who are, you know, kind of like, buy my t-shirt, buy my, you know, whatever to support it. Um, you've got groups that are unfortunately, you know, targeting parents and, and people who have probably been coerced into circumcision without knowing much about it and then making them out to be these evil, you know, horrible people when really it, it could be the doctor itself that, that recommended the surgery and, and all of that. And I think one of the things that that's kind of hard for me, I feel like sometimes I'm kind of on an island with what I do with this is finding the middle ground of how do we get the message out there, um, but how do we do it in a way that is, um, you know, that that is respectful, that is, um, you know, has got the science behind it and the the background and everything, because I feel like there's so much hearsay in terms of and, and you kind of think of i think of these you know or you kind of call them like the facebook moms groups that are like yeah. you know people who who have maybe they have a little bit of background and knowledge and they, and they take those facts and then they start kind of spinning them based on their own opinions and what we run into are are then these these publications that look like scientific documented evidence of things that may or may not be entirely true and i know one of the things that i try to do 
um, on my Instagram page as I try to work with organizations like Doctors Opposing Circumcision and some of the other ones that um, really do look at those scientific studies that are coming out, not the ones in favor of circumcision as much, but the ones that, that document the trauma. There were some studies in the 1980s that actually had to be stopped because the infants, one group of infants was giving, given anesthesia, the other group was not, and the group that was not was having such horrible results, they, even, they stopped the study before it was even done. And so I think, you know, relying on those studies is a way to really kind of get a message out to um, a group that may be so convinced because medicine is, is convincing us that, you know, in this country, for some reason, circumcision is the only way. And Nick, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I'm going to let you talk now. You're good. I mean, uh, that's, that's totally awesome. Like, I, I want to spread, like, information and education um through things like youtube and stuff like that I, I feel like that's an avenue that people haven't really um went to uh social media is a great thing and i i, I follow you on instagram I, I think the things you're doing are awesome thanks yeah and and to like preface the episode um this is our first uh intactivist podcast i don't really have a name for it yet <laughs> i plan on hosting this like weekly i guess uh i have some topics um also that oh, we can were we, were we doing the podcast right now i thought yeah yeah oh, okay cool well i got cool seemed like a yeah i wasn't sure if we were yeah. recording yet or <laughs> yeah we're 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 going we're going okay okay awesome. cool awesome <laughs> yeah so basically i'll have to um put a little photo over your face <laughs> to censor you uh, and also that's, that's fine if you don't mind i think it's so fucked up that you you have to do that because like what it's like yeah. it's so it, yeah it's 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 just so you know and i i will um i guess i could say i'm trying to think of what i can say to help identify myself um i'm a lgbtq man in my early 30s i live on the east coast um, I work in the, the field of education with a background in science. I, I, I'm hesitant to say um, what ages I work with just because of, of job issues. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you can, you can have a message and then someone hears that message and maybe they don't agree with it and then they spin it and all of a sudden it becomes you are now this, um, you know, person who is, is not what you intended the message to be and that's where unfortunately um it it runs into issues with censorship which you know i hate i wish i could come out and just and just say my full name and just you know and just talk about it as i am and, and maybe i could um i'm sure probably at some point i will but at this point right now um especially um yeah. not being tenured yet in the job that i am currently working i'm, I'm really hesitant to do that so um, you can, you can call me, um, I, my screen name is Intactivist Otter. You can call me Otter3 or just Otter or whatever, whatever works is fine. Um, so. Right, yeah. Otter it is. Cool. <laughs> um, so I guess a basic question would be like, are you cut and why? Okay, interesting question to start things off with. I like it though. <laughs> um, yeah, I am. And I was cut as an infant, one day old, I believe. Why? Um, that's an interesting question. You know, I've tried to probe my parents on this and they don't have a good answer beyond that's what everyone else was doing. Um, it was recommended to us by your pediatrician and we thought it was in your best interest. So unfortunately, you know, I don't agree with that rationale uh, in any way at all, but that's where I am at right now. Right, right. Um, I guess I can answer it too. Uh, I'm also cut and I was cut as an infant. Not sure exactly when, but um, the reasons why, well, my dad uh, actually knew about restoring uh, foreskin and whole movement and stuff but he never actually did it but um also 
uh, decided to have me cut also because of family tradition. Uh, I'm a Jewish person also. Um, my mom was also sort of fell for it because she thought it was normal and a thing that we all do, just like that sort of sounds like, um, yeah, many people are just manipulated or misled, I feel like, and it's kind of sad. Um, yeah. Uh, for me, I was cut also as an infant. Um, I was born in the late 1980s, and at that time, it was very common. Um, I have never asked my parents about why, um, but just kind of based on what I've learned about that time period, my guess would be that because it was the 80s when we were circumcising 80 to 90 percent of boys in this country, it was probably recommended on the part of the doctor. Um, and I've, I've never brought it up to my parents because I, <laughs> I still feel like it's, it's kind of an awkward conversation and, and I'm hesitant to then bring up the whole topic of um, intactivism and, and restoration. I feel like um, I, I don't have anger with my parents that it happened. Um, I feel like probably they were none the wiser um, but it's also to me somewhat of a private thing that I, I don't really care to let them know about the restoration that I'm doing right now. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, I sort of talked to my parents about it cause they're sort of open, uh, like that. Um, my dad sort of supports me with this whole thing and he understands that the damage, um, done, but for some reason he like still did it, which kind of confuses me. Um, I think uh, he's deaf and um, he sort of wanted to fit in with the family and sort of not really want to break the cycle. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that was sort of uh, part of it, which was interesting. Um, also, my mom was just very uneducated about it. So that could also be a part of it and a part of the problem, I mean. Because, like, women are having children and, um, you know, just wanting them to look like their father or whatever. <laughs> it's kind of messed up. Well, and there's, there's no, if you look at the um, sexual education curriculum that is adopted in, in most states, and most states are, are kind of this fear-based abstinence only where it's, it's the very basics of um, human sexuality and, and not much else, but even the ones that are more, um, you know, more open and, and more um, detailed often do not have anything about intact care or even diagrams of, of what being intact looks like or what that even means <laughs> or what that what that even means or, you know, how you're supposed to wash in the shower, what, whatever. It's just not even included. And so uh, for a long time, I think, you know, boys who were intact would feel very, you know, singled out and yeah. not, not really know how to identify or how to deal with that. And some would even ask to be circumcised just so that they could fit in. Right. Yeah, that's, that's been my experience. Uh, I've talked to intact people um, that are Canadian or even American and they feel like they don't fit in. They feel like um, if they have a sexual partner that they'll have to sort of explain them what's going on down there. And basically, um, it's just backwards. It's so backwards. I don't know. But definitely uh, education is an issue. And I, I was blessed to have... Um, I went to a high school that had somewhat of a decent health education where there was photos of the uncircumcised um, penis, but it was just not really debated or explained to like what this actually does to you or like why we do this or, you know, it's, it's just weird. It was, it was like something that we kind of giggled at and then skipped over and then it was over. And now that I think about it, I, I think of maybe one conversation I had with my parents when I was rather young, probably, you know, five or six years old. And 
maybe was just starting to think about circumcision and and realizing that some people were you know were intact and i think i asked something about it and you know they said well you don't have your foreskin and then i said something about well what is that what does that do and i think i remember um them saying oh it's just a flap of skin it doesn't do anything and and we just cut it off because it didn't need to be there and it, you know it's it was it's those kind of explanations that are so you know made of people's kind of lack of education about what's actually going on down there you know it's um and and you know we didn't know that it has millions, not millions, but thousands of nerve endings and, you know, that it can pleasure, be one of the most pleasurable parts and, and all of this. And it's just like, oh, it's just a flap scan. It's just, it yeah. need to be there. There's a cool word that I learned the other day. It's like Meisner's corpuscles. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which yeah. is fascinating. Yeah. Well, you lose a lot of those too. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's connected to your brain. It's, it's like your body part. I mean, it's, part of your body you're cutting off yeah i think it's even more specialized than just a part of your body you're cutting off right yeah it's erotic tissue so you don't have much of that tissue on your body it's really like a specialized um potent neurotransmitter stimulator right like when you stroke that tissue when you manipulate or stimulate that tissue it's not like when you stimulate other tissue on your body. So this is like really, really precious tissue to us. It can cause this erotic sensation in your body, the tissue that is removed via neonatal circumcision or circumcision in general, right? The actual tissue that is removed can stimulate erotic sensations on your body. And that's like an important sensation for humans. Totally. I mean, the removal of that is really, you know, I don't want to say crime. I don't want to say these things, but it's the significance of that is of the highest possible caliber. It's an atrocity mm-hmm. to remove this from an infant in, in a, you know, violent manner like that. And even if it wasn't violent, it's still the significance of that tissue um, cannot be understated and cannot be trivialized. And, and, and how that's being done right now in our society is really a tragedy. Um, how, how we are going about um, diminishing the value of something so important for men and women, just this, their genital tissue, right? Their, their specialized mucosal membrane, erogenous genital tissue is being removed routinely from neonates in this country and causing a lot of trauma. Um, I'm not sure how that, this is still flying under the radar. I mean, obviously I know the rationale and the reasons, but the, um, how that is happening is still kind of eludes me um you know the the ability for that to not get elevated into the public discord right now is really confusing when we're elevating all these other social justice issues right now to right and making them the top priority this is a top priority yeah for Mm-hmm. our government to tackle and people to tackle in general. This is a top priority. This is children, neonates being routinely genitally mutilated in mass. I mean, that, I wish I was kidding, right? I wish that was a comical statement an overstatement, something that wasn't actually based in reality. But what I've come to be know to be true is that is exactly what is occurring. Heinous mm-hmm. denial trauma on infants in mass. Um, that that has to be addressed and responded to appropriately here because it's causing a lot of chaos and trauma and um, just senseless loss of something so precious to us. Senseless loss of that. That that the solution is so easy, right? It's not complicated. It's it's literally we just stop performing penile modifications on on neonates and people that can't consent. It's that easy. You just put the scalpel down and walk away. It's not even a complicated solution that requires all of this complex planning and things like that. It's, it's a one-step solution. Well, and there's so much research now on the brain and trauma and, and trauma brain and, and how traumatic events, especially at a, at a very young age like that, shape the brain. Um, and we know, you know, we now know from research that that can have permanent uh, 
damage or, or changes to the way the brain works. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, people are, are having trouble accepting um, because that's, you know, along with the idea that we want to make circumcision a part of mainstream culture, there's also this kind of idea of, I think toxic masculinity feeds a lot into it. It's this idea that, uh, well, you know, he's a male, he should be able to take it. It's, it's a sign of, you know, strength. It's a sign of toughness, you know, if, and I've, I've seen as I've read a lot of different, you know, things about why people are circumcised. A lot of times men will accustom it to this kind of, not necessarily coming of age, but as a, you know, well, we're going to make a man out of him and get him circumcised, which is, you know, it's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Um, but I feel like that is part of what feeds into this idea of why it is so common. And then also just this kind of a abandonment of thinking. I think we are so prone as a society right now to apathy on a variety of topics. But I think this is a topic where people are kind of just like, oh, we're getting him circumcised. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. that's, you know, that's your choice. And it's one of the things where it's, yeah, I think it's 50-50. I think it's some people that, that truly do not understand what's going on and, and don't understand what the process is. And then I think it's some people who know, but either have no desire to change it. It's, you know, it's not me, so it's not my problem. That, that kind of mindset to it. Yeah. And, you know, there have been cities that have, I think San Francisco tried to enact some anti-circumcision legislation and I don't think it went anywhere. Um, but I think that's what we run into when, <clears throat> when bringing it. And I've, that's, that's really cool, Carter, that you've brought it to elected officials because I've, I've never even thought about doing that. Um, but it's, it's, yeah. How do you get that message to them without them just laughing in your face? I remember the first time I saw bloodstained men, um, I was living in the, the South at that time. And I was in a car with some friends of ours and we were driving through our town and we bloodstained men just happened to be there because we were a college town. So they were there protesting on the roadside. We saw them and, you know, I first kind of saw it and thought, wow, is this really, I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> um, but then there were a couple women in the car with me who just started laughing. They said, that's the dumbest thing ever. Why? what do you mean you're protesting that? Why, why would you protest something so, so insignificant? What a, you know, what yeah. a bunch of sissies, that kind of thing. And I get that, that too. That really, you know, it, it, oh, it yeah. was a, it really opened my eyes to this idea of this being a men's rights issue. Yep. Um, and it being, you know, not from a sign of weakness or anything like that, but it being a, you know, why are, why are men automatically being shut down when they speak about something like this? Yeah, it's so crazy. Like, people are like, oh, you should be focusing on bigger issues, like all these atrocities happening in the larger scale. And then like, okay, what are you doing for that stuff? And like, yeah. I feel like I can do something good for this cause, so I'm going to do that. Something I'd like to chime in real quick, and I really want to be careful on how I address this specific point, but right now, a lot of individuals and groups and movements are not necessarily vying, but they're trying to be, um, they're trying to get their message to the top of the concern list right now, right? So I wonder, you know, there's speculation in the back of my mind. I'm not coming out here and saying this is what's going on, but I certainly have wondered about this myself is, is the hostility, especially from people on the left side of the political spectrum who really seem to um, value elevating the concerns of minority groups and disadvantaged groups of things like that, if they're concerned with this movement of men who feel disadvantaged, who feel um, that their level of privilege in life 
um, has been impacted by this event that happened to them, do they feel threatened by this kind of jumping to the top of the concern list? Now, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying this is what's going on, but for some reason I have this sinking suspicion about it. And I'm not looking to get attacked because I shared these thoughts. I know that, you know, you guys aren't going to do that, but I, but um, I wonder about that sometimes. I wonder because it, when, when you really begin to think about it, this, this issue, this isn't like my, my voting rights were taken away or I never had them or something like this. This isn't really a civil type of issue. This, this is, was really a extreme assault that happened to me, right? Like I was strapped down and, and really horrifically violated. I know, you know we all were. Um, and so this, this is almost in like a different realm than other types of social justice issues. I'm not looking to have like my rights restored and these types of things. You know, I was assaulted and it almost feels like a declaration of war on me. I mean, the first reason that we subscribe to being citizens of a country is for physical protection. And that was just robbed from me in the immediately in, space, in a uh, second, in an a instant, really disgusting, disgusting way. I, my viewpoints really changed after I, I went out of my way to really consume content around infant circumcision and looking right in intimate detail on what's taking place. Some of these procedures are 30 minute long, just torture, just absolute torture, um, you know, dungeons for these children where they're their tissue is being just gouged away at slowly, painfully over a significant period of time. Um, and what I've also come to learn is that there's a wide spectrum to the degree of tissue and structures that are removed from neonatal circumcision. So there could be one child who has a few millimeters of tissue removed, right? And then another where the entire mobile skin system on the penis, the frenulum that, you know, ob obviously the ridge band is nearly entirely ablated um, in every instance, but just radical penile modification surgeries that are really rendering these children quite sexually mute for, for the rest of their lives or, or seriously disadvantaged for the rest of their lives. That is not how it is commonly known right now. And that, that partially is the case for me personally, right? We're probably all familiar with the different types of circumcision that exist, right? Low and tight, high and tight, these right. kind of formal terms right now. I would say I probably had like 60 to 70% of the total amount of tissue that can produce erotic sensations, right? The mucosal membrane tissue removed from my penis, right? That's not a small trivial thing. My frenulum was nearly entirely ablated. For my penis, this is devastating psychologically to me. It it is like a prison in my mind sometimes. I'm like, oh my god, I'm a victim of this horrific genital mutilation that's completely changed my, you know, the the ability to receive sensation on this important organ for me. Um, that that is not something that is really typical of any in of any of these other types of social justice movements. I was like horrifically assaulted and mutilated and so were, were many other men here. Um, and so I'm shocked that we're not able to integrate. I, I almost think it's so overwhelming for people to even begin to understand this issue that they just disengage. It's so overwhelming to begin to actually unravel and crack this code when you have to begin to accept, oh my God, we, we literally systemically endorsed genital mutilation on fragile infants. How do you even begin to associate that in your mind in a Western regime, in a Western society where we value individual freedom and, and, and expect to not do atrocities like this and, and consider ourselves above that and higher than that? How do we begin to integrate this into people's minds that, oh shit, we as a people, we as a society, committed an atrocity on on like very high up on the scale of atrocities even um so that's where i'm at now that's that's currently where i'm at in my mind and and what i've settled on recently and that really changes the way that i pitch this to people as well i think a lot of people want to be gentle and um you know want to deliver this message in a way that doesn't um cause alarm and things like that, but I can't genuinely do that. Um, and 
you know, expect, or I can't, it doesn't feel right when I yeah. try to deliver the message in that way. It doesn't feel genuine and coming from a place um, of actual sincerity any anymore. And so, although I'd love to, although I'm looking to be diplomatic and engage with people in a very diplomatic way and be calm and rational, I, I really do want to highlight the severity of what's going on. And then I think when you do highlight the severity, it influences the resolutions for this. I'm not really okay with just a policy change and an apology, right? I would be okay with that for so many other things, but not genital mutilation of my body. So that's one where now I genuinely feel like someone very disadvantaged in society. I had incredible penile trauma as an infant that caused profound physical and psychological consequences, right? How did this influence my neurological networks as a developing neonate, right? And when you introduce that type of penile trauma, how does that, how does that influence, you know, your brain during this time of incredible plasticity? Um, I don't know, not in a good way. Everything that I've seen would, would lead me to believe that this is actually, um, you would have to prove to me that this didn't really cause a lot of issues and obviously people have different ways of mitigating that trauma, right? Genetic, there's genetic potential to mitigate that type of trauma. There's environmental things that can influence it. Um, I'll tell you for myself, I had some wickedly um, difficult times as a very young child, being very afraid of the dark, being very apprehensive, having anxiety like four, five, six, seven years old, right? As early as I can remember, I had really difficult um, anxiety issues and being fearful and scared, the lights would turn out and I would like huddle into a ball and shake, yeah. right? So I think I was, I don't know what else would be the cause of this. Certainly I, I can't say for certain, but I maybe, right, maybe my early infancy, heinous penile torture and trauma. And for me, the, the actual physical damage is, is pretty high up on that spectrum. So. I believe that influences the psychological trauma that you experience. I do think that had an impact. And honestly, you'd have to prove to me that it didn't. Any type of intuition would lead someone to believe that penile trauma in infancy can potentially lead to quite serious psychological consequences immediately and later on in life. Yeah. And I, I went on a tangent there, I feel like. but I, I don't know yeah. how how women cannot connect the dots here between acts like horrifying uh sociopathic and psychopathic uh tendencies by males sometimes can exactly. be caused by uh some of this uh penile trauma and also i've experienced uh wetting the bed uh, problems wetting the bed um anxiety uh and being afraid of the dark things like that i share that um experience um i don't know if it's related to that but i don't know if i could attribute 100 percent. i don't know if it's you know I, I i can't say it's causation or right what it's it'll be tough to prove that but also i, I don't know how could how could someone look at this and be like you're not experiencing that that's bullshit or hey that's that's not important or i don't even know like it's 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 crazy yeah, that was going to be a question that I was actually going to ask was how many of us have, I know for me, um, it's, it's been pretty much lifelong bouts of anxiety and, and depression on and off. And it started in childhood, kind of like um, you all said, and, and, and there was never really a trigger for it. Um, I know there were, there were a lot of things that were blamed for it. Like my parents divorced when I was really young. They said, oh, it's the stress of the divorce. And then, you know, there were a bunch of other things that you know, maybe they had some impact on it. Um, but I can speak from, you know, the, going through the process of restoring, and, and I'm glad to talk about that more later. Um, I just finished two years of, of restoration and I'm still right. going, but, um, you know, I have noticed since going through that process, a major drop in anxiety and a major um, boost in confidence. And, you know, and I, I don't want to talk about it too much because I feel like I, I, I'm 
I feel like I'm, no, no. About I'm, I'm on that same ride, right? You now. know, I feel like I'm on those those erectile dysfunction commercials where they talk about, oh, I'm so confident now that I can, you know, but it's, it has been a, a night and day change. Um, and it's, it's something that even, you know, when I, when I talk to my partner about it and, um, and, you know, he is empathetic to what I'm doing, doesn't exactly understand it, but is, is supportive. And, you know, and even he said, you know, I've noticed a difference in the last few years of just kind of how you are, how, what your, you know, what your disposition is. Yeah. No, so I, I feel like it's, you know, I, as much as I, I do agree, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of trauma that, that comes as a result of it. I also want to speak to the fact that, um, you know, it's it, that, that trauma doesn't have to be forever, that there are ways to work through it and that there are, you know, I, I think um, back to the Bay Area intactivists um, and I am totally blanking on the guy's name who was the, the really big intactivist for that group. Um, but he committed suicide because he just could oh, okay. not, um, he just could not live with, you know, Jonathan Conti. Yeah. Jonathan Conti. Yeah. Could not live with what had been done. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, my heart really goes out for all of the men who have trauma centered around this and who feel that they can't speak up because of a fear of, you know, being weak or a fear of, I mean, I've, I've had people before say, oh, well, you know, griping about circumcision is a gay issue. If you talk yeah. about that, that means you're gay. Yeah. Uh, because uh, you're, you're talking about your penis. I mean, it's some of the, the dumbest things I've ever heard, the, just the, the logic of it. That I know. Is, I've, is I've heard so that many people too. skirting around the edge of, you know, let's, let's talk about human decency and basic human rights. And that includes not tying someone down as a baby or a young child a lot of these are yeah. done as children too um you know in, in ages like eight to twelve um a lot of the circumcisions that are done at that age um, are actually done without any anesthesia at all and um that is that is an incredibly just traumatic and just you know i just can't even begin to imagine i as much as i hate being cut i think one of the few things i'm grateful for is that i didn't remember it because you know i, I think just having that memory would just be awful yeah no doubt and i hate it when people say oh it's okay when it's done as a baby because you don't remember it it's like what the fuck is wrong with you yeah i mean that that that's the equivalent of saying it that is. a child is raped by someone and they don't remember it, so it's okay. I mean, that's to me, that's that's but, what that is on the level of, and that but, to me, that kind of violation is never okay. My my mind goes to this immediately. Why aren't they weighing the consequences? Also, even if they don't remember it, there's immediate trauma, neurological trauma, right? The stress of this, the pain of this, is having an immediate influence neurologically. Um, on your brain, right? And so what are the consequences of that neurological trauma that's taking place? Like we're, we're talking about, you know, at a granular level, I can't speak to this very eloquently. So I don't have a background where I can really make sense of this, but I do know that stress and pain um, can have a lasting impact on neurotransmitters and more specifically regions of the brain um, like the actual structural changes to the brain can be impacted by pain and trauma and depression and things like that. And um, so during this time of incredible plasticity at, at the you know, peak of plasticity, you can have a really strong impact on those neurological structures, on those neurological networks, um, on the, on the you know, expression of neurons. So 
what are the actual true consequences? It, it, are we, we really, I would love to have this explored. And I think it's the duty of our government and our people and our medical community to actually give this topic the respect it deserves and give men an answer. Like what are the potential complications for my life because of this? You know, this is probably the worst trauma of most of our lives happening at the most delicate period of our lives. So right. to be fair and balanced, there are some considerations where if if the brain is the most plastic at this time, that might also mean that you can re, you can mitigate the trauma the best as well, because your brain can get back on track and things like that. But certainly for certain individuals, their lives are potentially being radically altered because of this trauma, right. their brain, their, their brain is being permanently altered because of this trauma that's taking place potentially to a significant degree. Um, I, I'm not sure that has to be accounted for as we are elevating minority groups and other people, um, or not as we, I really have to be careful how, how I talk about this, but as we're focusing on that and diverting incredible resources to these different areas to help people get to the same level, where is the support for me to get me? I, I genuinely do. This has impacted the trajectory of, of my life here and my career and things like that. This is something that I suffer with on a regular basis, both physically, right? And psychologically, a lot of men are in the same boat. This has cost me so much and there's nothing I can do about it. There's no legal framework for me to be able to challenge this for, to me. I'm not necessarily looking for direct money in my pocket, but I'm looking for support from the entities like the federal government, like the medical community that legitimized this and integrated it into a framework um, that made it acceptable to do this to me. I'm looking for their support. Um, on, and I think this is a really challenging battle to fight, but I, I'm like struggling even with restoring right now, right? So this is maybe one example that, I, that I'd like to bring on how these figures could potentially help men who, you know, they created a framework and they created a systemically endorse this practice. Um, so I feel like they have a responsibility now to address this issue that um, has resulted from it. And so what I would like to see and what I'm trying to begin to pitch, although I'm really in the elementary phases right now, is either the medical community or a certain medical community a one facet of the medical community or the government state state or federal entities investing in restorative technology for men that have been impacted by this not necessarily regeneration right off the bat that's that's probably something very very far ahead in the future but as an act of good faith to invest in you know, medical devices, right? Properly engineered medical devices and therapeutic counseling for men that have been impacted by this, right? I'm struggling to restore right now because I was cut so tightly. So I can't just pop on a device and have it work for me right off the bat, right? I'm having to go the T tape method and I'm trying to do that, but it's confusing for me. And I'm trying to make that work. And I've definitely had some success with it um, and I'm starting to figure things out, but it's this like, I have to essentially adopt an engineering mindset, tissue engineering mindset or something, right? It's not just this trivial little thing that I can bang out. It's really complex and significant time investment and psychologically it's destabilizing me going through this process. I don't, that's not the case for all men, but right, that's the case for me. I need like unique therapeutic counseling to be able to and this hybrid type of counseling where it incorporates restoration, like helping me figure out restoration, encouraging me to stick with it. Um, and also dealing with these really serious um, feelings that I have around this topic, right? It's, it's rage, it's, it's um, de depression, it's um, jealousy. It's like angst or, or wanting yeah. something that can never be all of the, and I'll finish off. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, all these different things that I don't know how to make sense of. And I don't know how to make sense of it, especially in a society that trivializes and diminishes all of these incredibly strong feelings that I have and says, you shouldn't be feeling this way. When I know 
with a type of confidence that people will rarely feel in their life that I, that what I'm feeling is completely genuine and mm-hmm. it's how you should feel about the situation. Um, and there's a way to move on from that. But anyway, I would really like to see the government. I think that's a tough battle to fight, but I see all of these groups getting government funding and things. I'm like, where is my support? I, I, this is like a direct result of this being tolerated. The government should never have allowed a parent or a medical professional. My society should never have allowed this to take place. If my parents expressed interest in this, I w- wish that I w- would have been taken away from my parents. I mean, not maybe everyone feels that way, but I certainly feel that way. As soon mm-hmm. as my parents were like, I want to have a penile modification on my <laughs> infant child. I, I would, I, I was like, oh my God, get me out of <laughs> yeah. The red button. Yep, this is not get okay. There, guys. <laughs> and if you didn't do that, then I'm like, why am I even a part of society? That's how it's done. Yeah. That's how anyway, it's done. I'll finish off on that. Yeah, well, my yeah, first... Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. No, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about what you're saying and one of the things that came to my mind is this idea of follow the money um, I think you know it would be great to have these services these, these kind of counseling services provided and I think part of it is um, we really have to look at circumcision as a business um, you know it, it's it's been proven people look at the sales of um, you know Sexual wellness products, we'll say that to be to be politically <laughs> correct, but specifically lubricants that replace the lubricant that's lost, um, erectile dysfunction drugs, different things like that. Um, those, those companies are making tons of money in two countries that have the most circumcisions on the world, and that would be the United States and Israel. Yeah. Um, and there are even have been accounts of doctors who when parents say no we don't want circumcision at wellness visits they will do forced retraction which can then induce a type of phimosis which then will require circumcision to fix and it's you know it's one of those things where um maybe some of it is is real some of it is hearsay um but i think when when people start talking about it and, and sharing these stories of what's happening um, we realize that that this is happening. It might not, it might not be happening as much as we think it is, um, but it, it definitely is happening. And I, I think a big piece of it is is to follow that money. I think that if you know if we had counseling for re- restoring and if we had you know counseling for wellness and all of that, we would have a lot of pharmaceutical and, and wellness companies that would be out of money. Um, I think we would. You know, and it's so sad to say that. And I, I think also the research of what's um, happening to the brain, I think that research is probably going to come somewhere out of Europe. I don't think it's going to come out of the United States um, just because we seem to be so dead set here on it, it's the only way and there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. And so I think it's going to be the European nations that really um start looking at that or, or maybe even out of asia somewhere where it's it's not as common there either yeah and i wanted to make a comment about the whole scientific thing um because something that came into my head first um like right off the bat was maybe measuring or uh doing an mri like an imaging map of the brain and during the circumcision maybe mapping how much like where, what parts of the brain are being activated Probably um, the pain centers and the pain uh, and the receptors are connected to um, your brain and like the functions of your body, more specifically your your um, foreskin. So I I feel like there would be high amounts of activity there, and a rush to that part of the brain could, um, in fact, totally change it at that point. So Nick, I, I think that you're a hundred percent on the right track there, that if we had that type of evidence, those types of metrics, then we would have a nail in the coffin checkmate type argument against performing neonatal circumcision. And that's exactly why 
it's not going to come at least out of the United States, right? Because that would immediately end the practice. It is so certainly causing a very significant amount of neurological trauma. It's embarrassing to suggest otherwise. If you have, you know, remove all ego from the situation, um, especially for some of these medical professionals and remove, you know, I'm not sure what is actually occurring, how they're able to turn a blind eye to, to what's taking place or based on what I've seen. I'm not sure if you guys have gone out of your way to watch videos of infant circumcisions taking place, but the majority of the ones that I've seen have seriously been, I, can, I didn't know they took this long, but like 20, 30 minute long sur quote unquote surgical procedures. This is what I want the public to know. They're on what, YouTube. What I want people to know. <laughs> this is not me. Um, if anything, I'm downplaying significantly what's going on here, significantly downplaying the severity of this. Exactly. This, this and, and some of them, like I even heard say of one of the, the videos that was actually a training video for a doctor made it to train other doctors to do circumcisions. And they intentionally took longer on all of the steps about that. To, yeah. be, wow. to make it clear what was going on and, and how to do this. And, you know, while the child was sitting there suffering and I just, I can't even imagine how, you know, and some of them that I've also seen, they mute the child. They they mm -hmm. dub over it. So the only wow. thing you hear is the voice of the doctor. Or they'll put a pacifier. It's like they almost gag them with a pacifier at times. Right. Yeah. Right. And, so and it's, strange. it's this idea that it, a, a sugar pacifier is somehow going to alleviate all of this pain. And, you know, when oh, it first God. started, they thought that babies could not feel pain. I know. They thought, come on. And, that and is so now, fucking... And now they know they feel it more well, what's going on there for them to reach that conclusion that's <laughs> that's a total collapse of any type of logical framework right that exactly thinking. a total collapse of that right. so i want an explanation for that i would like to know how this is this phenomenon is actually occurring and what's really interesting is i did a video about a, a month back where I spoke with this individual named John Nyman from the Nordic region. He's a part of an organization called Intact Norden. And after that video concluded, it, it was basically me kind of explaining my trauma. There was also this girl on there whose boyfriend was cut and she was explaining how it impacts her as a woman. And then also, you know, how she sees her, her boyfriend and, and understands the trauma that happened to him and how that just disturbs her. Um, and she can't make sense of this and can't, um, feel really comfortable with the situation because she understands that this is not how it's commonly known, that he doesn't even understand the real extent of what happened to him. And she has these comparisons, right? And so she's able to like say, you know, she's one of the few women or not necessarily, it can be man or a woman that's really able to um, give this the space that it deserves and, and critically think through um, the consequences for men. I, it's really, um, you know, her holding space for this issue like this was a really therapeutic thing for me. I was like, wow, you really are someone who can see right through the BS and, and really give this the respect that it deserves. But anyway, be, beyond the point there, um, what I was originally trying to bring up was after that video concluded and OBGYN reached out to me personally and was like, I was really moved by what you shared. I'd love to have a conversation with you. And we had a conversation and it was a really an eye-opening discussion that we had. He was previously circumcising infants in his practice and something changed and his department was no longer doing that. And then now he was in the process of restoring. He came to the conclusion on his own that this tissue was wow then he wanted yeah and so this is a very rare and unique thing that i i think is maybe quite novel i i you know i've never heard of another example of this <laughs> but i want to you know, on one hand i think this developing a relationship with this individual and he, he'll probably see this video potentially um and that's totally fine um developing a relationship with individuals is important to me and i you know 
I don't necessarily, I'm not responsible for the forgiveness or anything like that on, on his end, but I accept that he made terrible mistakes and I accept, you know, moving on, even though it's very difficult for me. Mm-hmm. On one hand, I'm like, how do we excuse this type of behavior? Um, how do we just move on from something that caused so much trauma in somebody's life, in people's lives? And not have any, you know, not, not really address that or not give that the, you know, there needs to be some consequence we believe, right? We believe as human beings right now, for the most part, pretty widespread philosophy and, you know, framework for justice. We believe that there should be consequences for um, assaults on people's bodies. Right. And so that was the current framework that I was operating under. This yeah. situation is changing the way that I view everything, the way that I view criminal justice, the way that I view, um, you know, imprisonment and things like that. I'm like, is the solution, this is now getting on a total tangent, but I want that person who did these acts not to suffer. I genuinely don't want that. I want them to understand that the reality that this, what you did and your blind, your blindness to it, what the impact was on victims. And I want you to work towards solutions for the people involved. And I think you have a duty, not just, not, I'm not just asking you to do this. I really believe you have a duty to do that going forward. Um, but at the same time, I just have reached the conclusion that I cannot support um, strong criminal penalties against these individuals responsible for that, but that carries over into so many other facets of criminal justice for me. I'm like, I don't really know if the solution is putting people in um, terrible environments for the rest of, you know, for significant periods of their life, hostile, you know, really difficult environments where they can't actually heal and, and, and reach, you know, a better place in life. So anyway, that was a total separate tangent. Yeah. I think a, I think a big piece of it is the idea of just education because a lot of these American doctors are this is what they're taught in medical school and they're they're taught that they're doing the right thing um, and they're they're taught that even as ironic as it is they're taught that they are following the Hippocratic oath by doing this even though the yeah. Hippocratic oath starts with do no harm and wow. I think some of the most powerful messages that come out of this um, are are from these doctors who maybe have been performing circumcision and then come to the research on their own about, you know, the foreskin and and how important it is. And I think those are going to be some of the key players who really start to inform the general public about what's going on. Because Mm -hmm. if you look at the way the way we get our, our information about medicine, at least in, in the United States, we look very much to doctors. We look very much to doctors' explanations. We are, um, we're not as, as big on like all of the homeopathic and, you know, we, we used to be, it used to be, you know, you would go with the, the old wives' tales of how to heal certain things. But now we, we are, with medicine being where it is, we look so much to doctors and yeah. You know, and, until doctors start speaking out and saying, you know, this is what I've researched and, and what I've seen, I think we're not going to see a big turning point. I think that's a fair analysis of currently how things are. Um, I noticed that a lot of people have almost a religious like devotion to medicine and doctors, right? And that they don't really consider the possibility that they're not as informed and aware as um, they would hope that they should be. And I now from pretty much exclusively this issue, don't, don't look at things that way anymore. I'm very comfortable kind of challenging that um, doctrine that exists right now. And I notice it carries over into other things. I'm not saying that I immediately became a conspiracy theorist or I even am one now on a lot of different things, but, and this is definitely a tangent that I only wanna briefly cover, but we look at other types of um, n- not necessarily prophylactic medicine, but one, one example would be the removal of wisdom teeth. If we look <laughs> at our European counterparts, if we look at our European <laughs> counterparts, 
if we do, the, the rates are, I mean, night and day different in, in many of those European countries and, and really around the world where we see here, it's, it's all, it became a routine procedure at one point in time. And I had my wisdom teeth removed, right? And there was no indication for it. Same. Right? I had no, no issues. They fit, they came in perfectly. They erupted mm -hmm. perfectly. And one, and I went to my dentist and he's like, you know, you should really consider getting those out. It could cause you extreme issues yeah. later in your life. And I'm like, you know, I was 18 years old. I was like, oh my, really? Shit. He's like, yeah, no, I see tons of people who have many complications <laughs> and can cause you, you know, serious conditions like neck vi um, infections. I was like, neck and what's, <laughs> what's the connection there? But I didn't really look actually into anything. Um, and I signed, I was like, sign up with an oral surgeon and I got my wisdom teeth removed. And now I'm like, you know, I actually would have preferred to have those teeth in. Same. They are important. Exactly. And, yeah. And so now as an adult, I'm like, that's interesting for me. I, I actually would have preferred to have those teeth in. I think it's nice having a set of four extra teeth um, and that removing those teeth, it's not necessarily the end of the world, but first of all, there's a lot of complications that could have occurred during that process. Mm -hmm. It's like, the nerves around that area are super sensitive and you can really disrupt them. Fortunately, it turned out for me fine, at least in that case, but it also potentially has an impact on the rest of your jaw, the rest of your um, mandible and things like that. So a lot mm -hmm. of things that people don't really weigh into consideration, um, they just kind of willy nilly go, I'm removing my wisdom teeth. You're also <laughs> put under general anesthesia some of the time and when I actually went and I explored what is going on with general anesthesia, I was like, what actually goes on right now? They call it putting you to sleep. Right. But it's really the, not at all like going to sleep. It's really mm -hmm. like being in a coma. And when you're in a coma, there's, that has a lot of neurotoxic effects on the rest of your body. And we find that people that are in, um, under anesthesia for long periods of time, have significant cognitive problems temporarily, but sometimes long-term afterwards, because they're, it causes neuronal cell death. So now that I've looked at circumcision, I'm like, I'm kind of like looking at everything. I'm like, this is not as it's commonly known. And I don't want to be a panic conspiracy theorist, but I really think, you know, we need to be a lot more careful than we are. I don't just go with the status quo anymore. And I'm not saying I'm necessarily right or I'm wrong. I'm just starting to question things, right? Before I go and, and go to the doctor, or do anything, I'll go read literature. I'll go read, um, you know, case studies and read through um, papers that have been published or evidence that has been presented and, and kind of reach my own conclusion. And what I find is that the medical professionals themselves have no understanding of what's going on in academia. And that's not true. Exactly. That's the extremist point. That's, that they might have some understanding, but what's being done at the clinical level and what's taking place in academia is completely completely different right. and so there might be all this evidence emerging but it takes 20 years to be applied at the clinical level so this is very interesting that i really you know think needs to be addressed there's also all of this emerging evidence on tonsil removal and adenoid removal right we all what do you guys know what those organs are responsible for doing <laughs> most people don't does anyone know? No, I have response? no idea, but I, I know everybody in my parents' generation had them taken out. Right, right. But so I was like, I had no idea either. Right? I didn't have mine taken out. My sister did, but I didn't have mine. But I was like going through a process of exploring all this different type of organ removal in our group. It's just weird to say, and it's not necessarily always wrong. But when I looked at the function of the tonsils and adenoids, you know, it's very clear that there's significant immunological structures right? They're responsible for identifying pathogens that enter our body and look at the vectors, your nose, your adenoids are right here, your tonsils are right here. These are like very important vectors. They're like specialized lymph nodes that recognize pathogens and create an immunological response. And they're also lined with a very unique type of tissue called mucosal assisted lymphatic tissue. We don't have much of it in our bodies. And these are two sources of very potent immunological tissue. And I'm like, does the average person know this? If I had like a sore throat and I went into the doctor um, and they were like, get your tonsils out, you know, you need to get your tonsils out. I would, I would say, whoa, yeah. whoa, hold on a minute. This is my important immunological tissue. I don't want to just do this willy nilly with this brazen blase attitude like they have. And again, 
we look at our European counterparts and the rates are so much lower. It's in absolutely horrifying. And again, the last thing that I want to cover, and, and seriously, I begin, this is almost too much, right? I want, I need to address one thing at a time. And right now my focus on infant circumcision, but I wonder, I'm not saying conclusively that these, these rates of these procedures are, you know, not, um, should, should be really kind of investigated and we need to maybe pull back on this. But I do think there is worthy, it's worthy of exploration based on what I, the conclusion that I've come to. I don't think I should be discounted just because I'm a layman. Maybe, maybe it's the people who don't have investment in keeping these practices alive that are the best people to begin questioning this, exactly. right? Medical professional. All right. Anyway, though, I'll move on from that. But the last <laughs> one that I want to say, which is not really necessary at this point, is appendectomies, right? Your appendix, getting your appendix removed that can really cause some serious problems, right? If your appendix bursts, you're really, that's a, that's a serious medical condition and you can die from that. But again, a lot of emerging evidence, not even emerging, pretty much ironclad evidence is showing that you, the first line of treatment should be antibiotics right. for, for your appendix or, or even a watch and wait approach. And that's oftentimes what they do in European countries where here it's like you go in and you say you have pain in your appendix that that is getting out immediately yeah but again what does the appendix do I think the only honest answer that we can give is we don't really know we don't really know the true impact that the appendix and again surprisingly the appendix is another organ that's lined with this unique um, mucosal assisted lymphatic tissue Mm -hmm. which is something that's really emerging um, in immunological research is something that's not trivial and potentially very important, but I'm not going to go down this, this whole route right now, but I think there's a lot of things that we take for granted that potentially in the future could turn out to be the, you know, we, that was not the right way to go about doing it, or this was more important than we originally thought. And history proves that's the case, right? Again and again and again, medical interventions in the past are now seen as this barbaric thing to do potentially, like, um, the procedure in which they split the left and the right hemisphere. I can't remember what that is called again, but lobotomies. Lobotomies, a lobotomy, yeah. guys. Like that was horrifying there for a while among certain people, but that's an extreme example. But anyway, I'm going to stop on that tangent for right now. But this, this topic led me to become very, very hesitant. I'm saying medical science in general is all completely wrong, but we need to take into account that right now medicine is dominated by for-profit endeavors right right? and it's for-profit medicine right now and and you need to understand the implications of that Mm -hmm. i wish it wasn't that case and i think there's a lot of good people in medicine but it is dominated by this ideology of we need to make as much money as possible that i genuinely believe that at this point yeah and that that uh sort of relates to a topic that i wanted to bring up and sort of shout out if I can, um, so North Carolina is reintroducing wow. circumcision into um, their Medicaid system. So um, people at Intaction are actually trying to fight this and bring it up to um, officials and things like that to uh, resist, basically. Um, and I think that privatized healthcare and things like that do not help um our situation because people are making money off of it and you know it's 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 disgusting um i think that you know democrats that you know like um health care for all and things like that i don't know i don't know if that's a good thing for us i don't know it, we'll, we'll have to see but um yeah i'm just interested in future It'll be interesting. I'm, I'm interested because I'm, I'm, I'm a Democrat. Uh, but one of the things I've noticed is that uh, as I run into intactivists, a lot of them tend to be either um, Republican or Libertarian. A lot of them are, are Libertarian that I run into or, or just kind of not in favor of one political party one way or the other. Um, but I, I think it's, it, it is interesting to see that a lot of these, you know, um, community medicine and, and you know welfare type things are 
so heavily focused on circumcision. It's, it's interesting that, and I sometimes wonder, are they, are they attempting to target people who may not be as informed or may not have as much of the education and background? Not, not saying that that's, you know, everyone in general who, who receives benefits. I, I think that would be very stereotypical to say that, but um, are they somehow kind of playing on, you know, the, the knowledge or, or lack of knowledge of people that are receiving these services? Yeah, they are. I, that's totally the case. And you can see it internationally. Um, my, my roommate uh, is from Africa. He uh, has first-hand experience with some of his friends being targeted uh, to um, go in for a circumcision uh, based on uh, cleanliness or uh, just that cleanliness. I don't know. Or like to prevent uh, STDs. I mean, if you live in a place with running, not even running water, if you can go bathe in a river and you have some yeah. soap you know, or I'm... even no soap, we're, we're in the time, I mean, there was... You know, in biblical times, maybe there was some degree of, of issue of really. Do you but genuinely think that? Because I'm kind of confused. I would believe that the the body would have right. adapted. This this actually the reality is is humans you know weren't meant to necessarily take showers in a river or something. Mm. Or exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the rea- the reality probably is that this is a se- quote unquote self cleaning organ it's it's not really necessarily cleaning itself but in the way that maybe we believe but it it's designed to never have to be washed right we wash it we wash our sex organs because they produce um typically when you're i mean this is the reality that's uncomfortable for a lot of people to talk about they but they produce um secretions that really are there to protect the organ which is ironic and so there's an odor associated with that and things like that. I think in the past, this was much less, you know, people were okay with this, right? This wasn't this disgusting, disturbing thing that needed to be washed away. Um, nowadays, you know, you certainly can, but it's not necessarily for the protection of your organ. It, it very well could be that washing it um, frequently could cause more issues that that's right. totally unfounded but it could it could be the case right because when you disturb that biome when you essentially drop a nuclear mm-hmm. bi- bomb on that biome that's there you know it has to repopulate with a bacterial biome and during that repopulation process you know when you disrupt that it, it has it's very fine-tuned and so we just your whole body in general is not really designed to be washed it's supposed to have this unique biome for it um, that's healthy for you. That's my understanding currently of it. So I believe that your penis also has a unique biome and, um, washing it, you know, with soap and totally getting it as clean as possible. Is that the healthiest thing? I can't answer that question right now. I you know, I think myself, I, but. I think a lot of that originated in the Victorian era, which again was this kind of reprise of circumcision that we saw, um, and during that time, cleanliness was such a big next deal. to godliness. It cleanliness, and yeah, cleanliness next to godliness. And I mean, you know, they would use great things like arsenic and and boron and all kinds of wonderful. You know, radium was big then, and and oh my god, you know, what are those things these, for the people that don't know? Yeah, um, acid, toxic radioactive elements and acids oh, yeah. and things that. Um, really can cause cancer and, and long-term health defects to your body. So those were popular during that time. And, and you know, at, I think also we had this idea of, at that time, sexuality was so repressed. Um, you know, the, the reason that boys were circumcised during the Victorian era was because they believed that masturbation caused everything from syphilis to um, epilepsy to lunacy um, and they they believe that somehow by by taking away that um, pleasure they were able to keep people more kind of in check and and also there was a big influence of 
you know, kind of religion and this idea of lust and that if we can, you know, take, take the part of the organ away that is responsible for lust, then we are able to, um, you know, somehow make life better for people or, or, or that kind of thing. Well, and, yeah. 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 I mean, I genuinely think they believe that, you know, sex outside of marriage and stimulatory activities outside of marriage would send you to hell. So if you genuinely believe that, or, or it would make it more likely that you were not going to be in favor of God. If you actually believe that, I mean, then I'm not saying it justifies this, but if that's actually, if you think your child's going to hell for all eternity, if he masturbates, I mean, shit. I don't know what the, what the, so do you let your child go to hell for the rest of it? I mean, I'm seriously not trying to excuse that. I think they're totally, completely wrong, completely, yeah. utterly wrong. I don't think there's any um, likelihood that that scenario exists at all, but it is interesting to think about, like, if you believe your, your child would burn in hell for all eternity, if he masturbated, what would you try to, would you just say, live your life child and do what you want and you're going to hell? Or would you try to find, I don't know. I seriously don't know what you would do there in that type of situation. Um, it's really an interesting question to think about because I, I do think that the only reason you go to that extreme length is if you actually believe that without any shadow of a doubt that your child was going to burn in hell for all eternity, unless you you know, went and had part of their penis cut off to curb their sexual enthusiasm and their, their lust and their desire. So I'm not, I'm not giving them an excuse at all. Um, and I, you know, I wish that other people stepped in and said, you're wrong and police the situation. But um, I don't know, how do you even blame those people? I, it's difficult for me. I'm, I'm always willing to explore and see maybe, you know, we should blame these people. But for me, it's difficult because if you thought that way, if that was your framework, then it's tough to say, you know, don't do any solutions that you possibly can to stop them anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, part of the reason why this practice is still going on today is because it's like a religious thing and yeah, people just use that excuse. And, and it's yeah, no, I've heard certain, um, it's not, you know, among Christians, they don't, it's not as tightly connected with their religion. But among Jews and Muslims, and particularly Jews, I don't mean to, you know, focus on the Jewish element of this. That's exactly what I'm doing right here, though. For them, it is a very sacred covenant, right? As you probably know, Nick, it is an extremely sacred covenant. And when I inject my own thoughts into their practice, the feedback that they give me is very serious, right? Mm -hmm. It is, if you pursue this, what you're pursuing is a cultural genocide of our people. You're severing our intimate, personal, important, precious, have you even heard that word, connection with our God. No, I haven't. I, I actually have a video. You will take something from us so, that we value with every single fiber of our being. Our identity lies partially in this practice of child circumcision. You take this from us, you're taking what makes Jews, Jews. I'm like, holy shit, I really, I had no idea, right? I was like, oh my, I didn't know a genital modification surgery had that much significance. I know, right? I really started, but it's like, it's, it's this yeah. binding thing for them. It's so interesting because I, I have um, friends who are Jewish who are, you know, I, I have right. some many friends who are- Many don't feel that way. Sorry, I should, I wanted to finish that. I'm sorry for just jumping in, but many <laughs> no, don't feel fine. that way. I want to say that many don't feel yeah. that way, but the ones that do, that is- that is part of the equation. Yeah. Right. It's crazy. I mean, I have yeah. friends who are who are both reform and orthodox Jews and it's so interesting just talking to them because you know the reform Jews I talk to I you know we bring up circumcision and of course they most of them in their temple perform Brit Shalom which is the Jewish right. welcoming right. naming ceremony. Love it. Great great alternative and, and they say well that's that's totally fine and they they say that you know having a Jewish lineage is what makes you Jewish, yes. not, not being circumcised. Whereas I talk to the Orthodox Jews and they say, well, if you're, if you're not circumcised, you might as well be dead to God. And you, you know, you're going to hell. I don't know what the Jewish version of hell is, but you're going there and you know, and it's, it's just, I don't know. I'm not Jewish. I, 
I don't, you know, I have a background in Christianity. I have the highest respects for Judaism and I, you know, I, I, it's, it's a touchy subject because it's, it you know, one of the things that we run into with intactivism is this idea of anti-Semitism. And there are some intactivists that are extremely anti-Semitic that blame the Jews entirely for it. And that will even go as far as, as trying to tear down, um, you know, Jewish communities and, and individuals around it. And I think that, you know, in, in the reality, we, we can't do that. We have to look at, you know, what is the context that this developed versus what is the context now? There are things in the Torah, like not eating seafood, not wearing um, two types of, of blended fabric together. And we, we break those now without thinking about it. But, you know, for some reason, this circumcision has, has held on in the Jewish community. Right. Um, and I think, you know, I've, I've had people on my Instagram that, that message me and, and I've gotten the same response where, you know, they'll say, well, why are you speaking out about this? And I'll explain, you know, why I'm speaking out about it. And now, you know, I, I preface any, any time I ever make a post about like, you know, Jews opposing circumcision or Brit Salom or anything, I, I always start out my description by saying, I am in full support of Jewish brothers and sisters. I in no way endorse anti-Semitism and I stand with you against anti-Semitism. However, talking with reformed rabbis and, and hearing about Brit Shalom and hearing their view of how it connects to Torah and, and the, the meaning of it, I feel like there is a shift that needs to happen. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, and I try to say that as respectfully as possible. But it's just interesting how that has stuck around while at the same time we've had other things that were part of Torah that are totally abandoned now um, because in the, the modern age, they're not really necessary. And yeah. I think it's, it depends just on how Orthodox, I mean, there's definitely a, a difference between talking to a Hasidic Jew versus talking to an Orthodox Jew versus talking to a Reformed Jew. You're going to get, you know, just, just like you would with different, you know, talking to a Pentecostal versus talking to a Unitarian, you're going to get, you know, yeah. variety of responses, yeah. but it, it is interesting to think about, you know. Right. And I don't know if you guys have seen my video, but I've actually um, called a local rabbi and uh, introduced the idea of Brit Shalom and all this oh, stuff. I'll have but to check that out. I did. Yes. That was, that was interesting. Yeah. Um, I hope to have more conversations like that. Um, Wow, as, as I a definitely Jewish want person. to check that one out. I think that's a pretty novel video. I don't think anyone's really produced that type of content before. I really like the direction that you're going here, Nick. Having guests on to talk about this, the, the approach of calling a rabbi, and I'm really um, interested in seeing what type of content you come up with in the future. Yeah, this I is mean. exactly what needs to be taking place. Is is just dialogue among civil diplomatic people who want to move this issue forward. And and there's been a lot. It's been that's been almost absent from the narrative right now right. and um, i think that's that's what intactivism is really going to need because for so long at least when i was first getting into it it was these very violent kind of you know almost like all caps screaming at people kind of posts or they would you know they would just show a picture of a penis getting ripped open during circumcision or something that was just it was almost traumatic to to kind of experience the message that went along with it. And I think they were, you know, they're trying to get people's attention, which I understand, but I think there are a large number of people who see that and just get turned off right. immediately. And they just, they shut down because it's, it's too much to emotionally process. And I think that, you know, if we, if we want this movement to have weight to it, if we want it to, to move forward, it has to be, you know this mature dialogue that is that is yeah. grounded in science that is respectful to faith and then that is you know also an idea is to connect it to fgm that's one yeah, way definitely a lot of there's if we can crack that code right that's going to lead to a lot of success but what i noticed is there's a very strong resiliency towards equating male right. genital mutilation, whatever you want to call it, male circumcision, penile modification surgeries on juveniles to what is taking place 
with women. And I've always, I've tried really unraveling why that might be. It's difficult, right? It's a very abstract thing to really- It's psychological. For me, it was, but I, I think there's a couple main reasons there. But I think honestly, to start in getting this out there, this conversation out there and getting, you know, really- the right people involved in this could lead to some major changes. Equating the two together in an appropriate diplomatic and civil way um, can really get the gears turning in people's heads. Um, so what I found though, the why they're resistant to this is because many individuals who are campaigning against female genital mutilation, they believe that by equating male circumcision to FGM, you're diminishing the significance of FGM. You're saying, because MGM is so, is so widespread, right? And people's attitude towards it are this, this you know, trivial little surgery. It's so accepted. Men get. So, so they're like, well, we don't want FGM, people to think of FGM as this trivial little surgery that doesn't have an impact on individuals' lives. And, and that right cause. there, they admit that they admit the equation. Sure, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, yeah, yeah, they do. Um, but they don't want to halt progress on their pursuit, right? And I genuinely believe that they, most people, just like most people in general, most people who are campaigning against FGM believe that male circumcision potentially has therapeutic medical value and that it's, it's, you know, a very minor procedure on a child, e even then it's totally wrong, right? Even if all those things were true, it still is completely unacceptable. And, and there, they should be held to a higher moral standard than that. And, and really, you know, that should be called out. But I, I don't think they understand how traumatic it can be and, and you know, very often is. Um, and essentially, they don't, and potentially, this is really, you know, putting a lot on them, but they don't, they might not want to see resources diverted from, that's not necessarily fair to say, because that would be saying a lot right there, but why do I have this suspicion? So I am going to share it. Um, maybe they do not want some of the resources being diverted towards MGM, or they don't want to have to, that, that, that might be more of a far-fetched theory. Than well, so but one thing, well, the last thing that I want to finish off on is um, when you, they, if you convince them that male circumcision is something comparable to FGM, then they have a, then they have a moral responsibility. They can't not integrate it into their agenda exactly. right and i don't think they're ready to do that if you can equate the two then it's totally sexist to only fight for fgm mm -hmm. in that case and only divert resources especially when oftentimes their resources coming from federal and private entities and things like that right there's money being funneled into fighting against millions of dollars right and not and the exact opposite is happening for men. Money is being fun funneled into promoting male penile modification surgeries. Government money, our money as tax paying citizens in America, millions of our dollars are going into circumcising Africans while millions of our dollars are going into fighting FGM. It's, Come on. it's so Come on. backwards. It's like, it's so, yeah. And it's, and I think, you know, part of it is people just don't, you know, you talk about going down the rabbit hole. It's, it's a big rabbit hole to go down and, yeah. you know, people don't think about that. People don't realize it. And, and I think too, you know, if we, if we get on the subject of Africa, which I think it would be cool to have like a whole episode just talking about. Yeah. The, I mean, the this... Africa HIV this one has been going for quite a while. I don't know how long it's been you guys going. Wanna, it's been yeah. going for a while. And, you know, the studies that came out from it, um, doctors opposing circumcision said that one of the big issues that came with the studies is that they didn't have follow up check ins. Um, and also a lot of the results of circumcision were self reported. And so if people had bad experiences, they were more likely to not report it for either fear of insecurity you know, and insecurity or, or whatever. And, and so the way that they were carried out were just, you know, not, not the greatest way to carry them out. And, 
and you know there's there are all kinds of conspiracy theories about you know what the what the true intent of it was and i'm not going to go into that but i think that you know when we look at scientific studies and we we look at the validity of of scientific studies we really have to say you know are we looking closely enough at the numbers and also who is funding this research who right. is who is leading this campaign and i know um you know there's, there's a lot of controversy surrounding bill gates and this whole thing but you know his his funding is pretty big into it there's some other larger organizations too that are are really big into funding and you know it's just interesting to me to to see what is and i don't want to go down that rabbit hole because i you know i feel like we could go on for one of one of the downfalls of intactivism too is is you've got kind of this faction of conspiracy theorists who are also yeah i I, it's so funny i've run into so many intactivists who are also part of the QAnon group who are (laughs) you know who are who are tagging their circumcision posts with save the children and i'll i'm not gonna lie I tagged that a couple of times, just maybe hoping I would get some of those people on board. But yeah. it's, it's, you know, I, I think the more that we stay with hard data and numbers and, you know, individual accounts from people, that's going to be what carries the message forward rather right. than, you know, trying to really go deep down the rabbit hole because yeah. it is i mean there there's so many conspiracy theories about it people have said oh it's for population control oh it's for this oh it's for that you know and it's it's you know when we get into that that's where we have to really wonder about you know what is what is the true intent yeah i think a total brain imaging map of an infant being circumcised would be absolute gold it would be the one of the most important scientific um, pieces that we would need to go into a court of law or any type of legislative office and say hey this is really fucked up and we should probably stop doing this shit but, i'm 100 percent in agreement um, with what you're saying nick absolutely the you know the potential for that happening um uh, you know who knows? Yeah, I can't calculate that. Who 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 knows? We could find someone, a rogue, right? Um, medical professional, physician who's willing to do that, who's willing to kind of. It, it would have to get approved by like an ethical committee, I believe, as well. Um, and I think that's where we'd get the biggest holdup. But I would totally be willing to have a larger conversation around that. Um, something that I think is potentially more realistic, though, is an imaging study that was done between intact and circumcised men and essentially bringing them both to orgasm and then mapping the response in the brain, right? Because I know with 100% certainty that the, the sensational experience that I have is completely different than a man who's completely, that who's intact. Right. Not and just a little bit different. Yeah. It's really a muted response. I, I would consider my sexual experience right now, largely muted, right? Where it's, I, I do kind of want to accurately describe it as well. It's primarily like a very weak urge, you know, upon stimulation. It's like a weak urge the whole time. It's not like this euphoric experience. It's like, mm-hmm. I'm just having an urge to do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, I don't know if pleasurable is even the right word necessarily. It's just like, gratifying but it's not this unique um explosion of sensory feedback it's just this urge to do something and it's it's fulfilling something but it's not really what it should be right and then you know so each like first of all our penises or mine at least like the scar is this far yes yeah, on my body <laughs> yeah. or down my penis i'm sorry so this is like what I'm tugging. It would honestly be like a joke if it wasn't so morbid, right? So it's like this, like mm-hmm. flapping a chicken wing, like experience, mm-hmm. just barely up and down. And that's all the sensation that I can possibly get is a little bit of stimulation from the remaining sliver of membrane tissue that I have left on my shaft. Right. So that's my a- whole sexual experience is, is this. Yeah. 
a little stimulation of a fraction of tissue, unless I use like a lubricant, right? And then I can begin stimulating the whole organ. But that for some reason is uncomfortable to me. Yeah. It's, it's become a, very uncomfortable to me. So all I really have is this one inch stimulation, at least during like ma a masturbatory experience, right? This one inch stimulation, the whole thing feels muted. It feels very, very, um, it is gratifying to an degree, but it's, it's barely, just barely, right? I'm trying to find mm -hmm. the right words to describe this because I think it's really abstract and difficult to break down. But then at the mm -hmm. very end, during orgasm, for example, it's a one second, yeah. you know, pleasurable feeling. One and done. And it's yeah, exactly. And then you're just like, oh. I, I, I just did this whole thing. I had... Yeah. It was this urge and then one second and then everything. This is not and then, what it's and then to be at all. The refractory period you can also talk about. It's like because... a day or something for me. Seriously. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I think, I, you know, I think a lot of times men don't feel entitled to speak on that because we have this, you know, societal expectation of being these kind of, you know, constantly sexually aroused oh, they, constantly yeah. you know and it's it's kind of this this idea that if you you know it's it's why people who go for erectile dysfunction drugs are so hesitant to have you know, the conversation <laughs> with the doctor about it because it it's it's like a sign of weakness or a sign of impotence and i think um you know it's just crazy to me to think about and i think we you know if we, if we continue this on with episodes i think there should be a, an episode devoted to um you know what the sexual experience is like and, and i can you know i've heard from so many men too whose partners suffer as a result of this and it's because uh, you know it's they they feel like their experience is not complete or they mm -hmm especially females experience extreme pain from mm. the excessive kind of jackhammering that guys yep. have to do to get any kind of stimulation whatsoever. Even, yeah. And, and it's like, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that it's kind of taboo to talk about because, which is so ironic because our society is so much sex sells, sex sells. But when you actually go, to try to talk about it from a, a, a standpoint of wellness and a standpoint of, you know, mental health and, and that kind of thing, people just totally shut down. And right. I think, I think that needs to be, you know, addressed. And I, I think it, again, needs to be addressed from, you know, a scientific standpoint using the correct terminology and, and a, a, a professional way of, of talking about it that doesn't, you know, necessarily right. reveal too much about what we're doing in our, um, you know, times with, with partners or alone or whatever. But I think it's, you know, I, I, one thing I found that works really well is, um, especially if I'm talking to people who are, are not as comfortable, is using a scale of like a one to 10 scale of saying, you know, if your sensation, where would you read it? Would you say you're a three, a four, you know? And, and I think one of the things I've noticed with restoration is that I didn't know what sensation I was missing until I started getting it back. Right. And it's by no way completely back. I would say, I mean, if I had to guess, maybe I'm somewhere around 60 or 70% now up from maybe 20 to 30%. But even that has been such a significant change yeah. And it is, you know, and, and it's you know, on one end, it is, it's sad because I'll never get it completely back. Um, you know, I keep <laughs> kind of holding out for Forge in and I, I think they're doing great things, but I don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime when that happens. But um, it's, it's just like, you know, I, I think some of the greatest testimonies come from uh, men who are circumcised as adults and were able to to tell the difference before and after um, and I in terms of sensation I think that's that's part of where the voices need to come and and also for voices for men who are restoring who you know need to know that restoration like for example I was I was talking to someone the other day who is is restoring 
and is you know doing it but is very feels very shameful for doing it feels very angry says i i shouldn't have to do this there's no reason i i feel terrible for it and you know i, I kind of tried to go through the explanation of well this is a way that you can take back your own body this is a way that you can you know take control over what you feel was taken from you what was taken from you um and it's but it's still there's there's just such stigma that goes along with it and i the i think that's one for me that's one of the hardest things it's just the stigma and the feeling like there's no one to talk to about it and i yeah. I can also speak to, um, for, for LGBTQ people, um, there is a, there exists within the gay community, this idea that if you want to talk about this, <laughs> you are trying to solicit someone for, you know, a date or for, for something like this. And, and so I've had, you know, where I've tried to bring up conversations about this before and then you know, people are trying to turn it into something sexual and it's, it's very much like, I'm sorry, that's, that's not what I'm looking for here. Right. Um, I want to be, you know, to, to share an, um, you know, kind of an anecdotal experience. And so I think that's, that's another thing that, that we run into. So. Totally. Yeah. That's interesting that you bring that up. Yeah. Cause I've noticed that myself, I've, you know, looked at so much content related to this and i've also kind of peered into the um the lbgtq sphere right i've, I've looked into that and i see that there is like this may and i want you 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 would have a better um you know picture of this but i've started to see that there's like this desire to have an intact partner among gay men potentially sometimes it's the complete opposite right but they're like purposefully seeking mm -hmm. out yep. intact men um yep for reasons that i'm not entirely clear about maybe because they understand the the difference it's a new exotic thing for a lot of american men right things like that but i've definitely noticed that that it's like this they're they're specifically seeking out intact partners um and i don't know how widespread well, they, that is but i'll come across something on reddit some forum posts and it's just like man after man after man expressing their interest in finding an, an intact partner and i'm like wow that's really interesting but honestly is it that unexpected at the same time like unfortunately maybe preferences do exist and i i would certainly want you know i'm straight but i'd want the woman i'm with to have intact genitalia and it, it would be disappointing if she was mutilated i'm not saying that's a deal breaker necessarily but i'd be like honestly it'd be something i'd really have to get over i'd have to be and I don't want to say all circumcised men are mutilated. It really is an identity type of thing, but I wouldn't necessarily prefer to have a woman that had genital, what I consider to be genital trauma. Now, that's not the defining characteristic of someone, right? And there are so many other things to value, but if it came down to raw preference, I would want a woman that had their whole genitalia in so bad, right? I'd be like, oh, I would be you know, it'd be difficult for me to accept that that happened to that person, especially if it was involuntarily as a child, that whole aspect would be different. I don't think as many gay men necessarily right now are thinking about that, right? But I think they just like, I, I don't know, maybe you can give a, a good answer for that, but. You know, I, I think uh, part of it, there is a uniqueness to it. It is kind of a, a thing that is is new um, here in, in the States and I think part of it too is just this idea that you know anything that when we talk about sexual health and we, we start talking about male sex organs there's this kind of idea that it's it's the gay men who are you know that's that's what they're interested in and so that's what they're they're going to be the ones leading the conversation on that and I think that that kind of plays into the whole um toxic masculinity thing too where you know a lot of straight men feel like they cannot speak out on this because they're afraid that talking about their penis will make them gay or they're afraid yeah. that I'm you so know done. wanting I'm to so make some kind that. of you know yeah. restoration or, or it, it means that somehow they are turning themselves <laughs> gay and i think you know That's that joke <laughs> that brings up a whole nother realm of you know sexuality that we have to we have to look into but 
I think that has is something that has kept so many men quiet. Um, and right, and it's is, and know. it's the shame that they associate this this whole sex thing with. Like, it's they're afraid to talk about it. They're afraid to like, um, they're afraid to see your point. You know, they're they so they just label you as gay. You know? Right. Exactly. I, I haven't necessarily been labeled as um, gay, but my grandma. Actually, yeah, I essentially have my grandma, who's definitely, you know, has that boomer mentality. And I honestly, am, I've heard some older people be like, I'm very offended when you use the term boomer. So I, my position on that may be a slightly evolving. But anyway, that baby boomer generation, right, um, is their their view of this, I think, is a lot different than previous generations, even even our even, you know, our direct parents generation, um, where for some reason, it seems that when there was any speak about or opposition to circumcision, it was intimately tied with gay men speaking up about this or something like that. I can't say that for certain, but my anecdotal experience has been that, has been these older people. They really do oftentimes equate, you know, discord around circumcision with kind of a, a, a gay movement or a, a gay pursuit or something like that, an LBGCQ pursuit, something like that. And so when I brought this up with my grandma, she, she was like, you know, very shortly after she, she asked if I was gay. And I was like, where did this correlation, <laughs> where did it come from? Yeah. Where did this correlation come from? And she explained to me that in the past, the only discord that she had heard was from gay men um, right. expressing that they were upset about this. And so that's how she, she equated it. Um, and it's disgusting. Like you. <laughs> yeah and i just yeah. it did not it never sat right with just so even if that was the case even if that was the case why do you think being upset about a penile modification surgery has anything to do with being gay right. why why do you possibly you're not thinking grandma you're not connecting any type and you're of revealing problem. you're revealing your homophobic uh, identity so it's like you know, yeah i mean I wouldn't <laughs> okay, <it>. boomer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. And, and so guys, I, I feel like we could talk about this all for, day, for <laughs> hours, yeah. and I, yeah. I wish I could. Um, I have to, to run pretty soon. Sure, but how I, long have we been talking? Oh my gosh, two hours. Wait, yeah, quite two hours. Time. So, that, oh my God, full <laughs> conversation. Well, the one thing that I want to end off before you go, and I know I just interrupted, is I would really appreciate, you know, some of these things that I might have shared here might be controversial, right? And I, what I'm hoping is, you know, if I said something wrong or if I said something uncomfortable to any audience, even the audience that's watching this or eventually ends up watching this, you know, my mind is always in a state of flux and is always evolving. And right now this cancel culture is really popular. I don't want like my life to be uh, upended and significant consequences because I shared how I feel about things right now. I really don't think that's appropriate. And it's, it's deeply concerning for me. Like I, I don't want to suffer from just speaking my mind in this moment. I definitely think it's important that we call people out for the wrong things, but um, you know, I'm scared right now bringing up these topics. I'm, I don't know the right way to position them. I, I don't have a clear answer. Yeah. How to, so I don't, I, while I'm going through this formulated time, I, it would just be devastating to me if this got picked apart and I got my, you know, right. people came after my career and things like that. I think I would, I'm really trying to change that narrative around cancel culture because we shouldn't be trying to necessarily ruin people's lives. Certainly some people need to be called out, but the next steps after that shouldn't be you're done, your career is over this. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but my my mind is definitely evolving on this. I'm like, well, if they made a mistake, if they were clearly in the wrong, then why isn't the solution getting them back on track, getting them to a place where they can apologize for their mistake and we can move on? That was how things worked in the past. Um, and you know, nowadays, now that you know people can go back and watch the videos and things like that and have that on the internet forever. Right now, it seems like you're really screwed if you make a simple mistake. And I just, right. not just even a simple mistake, it could be a serious mistake even, but I don't think right. that should be exactly. a light sentence. And the last thing I'll finish off on is that's the opportunity that I'm giving and we're giving to the people who committed, who, who you know, circumcised children, right? We're saying you made a mistake. It was a really, you know, even if you did not have a true understanding 
electing to have a penile modification surgery on your child, in my mind, is just a complete collapse of your moral, ethical, logical, um, legal framework on things. And I'm saying, let's work towards a better solution together in the future. Let's move past these mistakes that were made and reach a resolution. So I would like that same respect to be given to me. I might not always say the right thing. um, And that's, and I should be called out if I say the wrong thing, but my life shouldn't be over. My life shouldn't be ruined if I make a mistake along the way right now. Exactly. Right. And like, we never know how this video is going to be received or things like that. I just ask that we be respectful and in the comment section and things like that. And um, I don't know if, if you have an I issue, the, if you have an issue, speak up. Is, yeah. And, and ask questions. I think that's one of the best things I can right. recommend is, is ask questions. So um, do we have, maybe we just want to say kind of where all of our resources are located online. Um, yeah. Do you want to so, give social social medias or, or ha- whatever the best way to get in touch with you is? Good idea. Yeah, great idea, man. Um, so if you, I'll, I guess I'll go first. So um, I probably am just going to share my personal Facebook page, which I have completely public right now. And so if anyone wants to follow me or friend me on that, that would be excellent. I also, a while back, um, started a server. Now I'm just a mod in the server, but it's a Discord server called the reclaimers and it's essentially a community for intactivists that's kind of like the wild west right it's a it's not moderated very heavily which is why i kind of disassociated my or um you know distanced myself from it in the past but if you're interested in engaging in kind of a no hold you know we're not holding anything back here and learning from other people. This would be an interesting community for you to be a part of. There's a lot of good information shared. There's a lot of you know people that are hostile and things like that. So I don't necessarily um, associate myself with it, but I am in the community because great resources are shared in there. Studies are shared. It's a compilation of all these different um, resources that people have acquired together. And there's a lot of discussion that happens. There's a lot of, you know, you have to be prepared to see a lot of hostile stuff. It's just like Facebook, right? You go on Facebook, you don't know what you're going to see for that day, but, right. we, but nothing's censored, right? So that's the type of community this is. It's, there is censorship, right? If you say I, I, all the Jews should be executed, you're on, you're out, right? You're not in the server anymore. So there's that type of moderation, but there's a lot of gray areas that are tolerated. I don't really want to be responsible for that, but I certainly, you know, am interested in hearing what people have to say. So anyway, I'm going to share a link to that and invite link to that server. Um, And then something that I'm building up is my own server that is actually heavily moderated and only civil and diplomatic discussions will take place in this server. And that's something that I'm maybe interested in sharing down the line as well for people who are interested in being a part of that type of community where it's much more civil, um, and diplomatic and project focused and things like that. Cool. All right. And you can find me um, on Instagram. My page is intactivist underscore otter three. That cool. will be where all my stuff is located. Awesome. Um, okay. We'll include like a screen maybe at the end and yeah. put all of our um, handles there, all of our yeah, links there. Yeah, I can, I can do that and also make, uh, make annotations on the video so people can just click on the cool little things yeah i just want to say um thanks for joining me um i I hope to have another episode in the future um yeah i mean we could talk about uh more about restoration we didn't really get to that one um also about more ways to like engage honestly for the viewers Uh, we can talk about that in the future um, I just want to shout out uh, Colorado ABC and their fundraiser going on right now. Uh, I made a video about it. Uh, Colorado? Yeah. So Colorado ABC is like uh, a group I'm a part of, and they're registered oh. within the state of Colorado. As a so, nonprofit? Yeah. So well, I'd love to learn more about that in the yeah, future. Yeah. Um, so we're, we, we just do like body rights, activism, and like... Cool. Environmental things as well, maybe um sort of like cool sounds good um yeah thanks for watching if you made it this through this far through two hours wow um uh 
yeah, I guess this will be uploaded quite shortly and I'll be uh, editing it. Um, yeah. That's All it. right. Sounds good. Hey, great talk, guys. Looking forward to maybe another conversation in the future. Yeah, thanks. All right, take care. Yeah. Bye.